out of Panama, a couple of our monthly supported missionaries, and the church family members. Bow your heads with me if you would a moment of prayer. Father, thank you for this day, the opportunity we have to be together, to worship you. We pray for those who have joined us online, and we just pray your blessing in their lives, and these, especially these moments as we worship together, look into your word together. Father, we pray this morning for St. Paul Lutheran Church. We pray your blessing on their service today, and uh, that you will move in hearts and lives through their uh, in-person and online services. We pray for Pastor Graham as he leads the congregation in this time of, uh, of interim and transition. We give him wisdom as he, as he helps lead the congregation and, and into that next stage of life for them as a body. And Lord, we think of our churches in Panama, we think of the Aqualoos campus, and I just pray your blessing. Lord, on the church family that is there in that community as they uh, continue to reach out to the community, you know, offering uh, the, the food support, the food bank that we are able to be a part of, and, uh, and all the things as they reach out to their community that you will just bless and honor and encourage. I think of our church uh, missionaries, we think of the Smiths up at Place of Hope Ministry in St. Cloud, and, and the variety of ministries that they bring in that in that context, and the two campuses they have on both sides of St. Cloud, we pray your blessing. Lord, on those congregations and in the ministries uh, throughout the St. Cloud area that they are providing, and uh, we just pray that you'll give wisdom and grace and favor, and we think, Lord, of, uh, of the Oslins as they continue to minister in Portugal and in Angola, currently because of the COVID things, and we, we know they're, they're in one place, and that's it, and we just pray your blessing on the time that they have, the ministry that they're if involved in now, that you'll continue to protect them health-wise, and then bless the ministry, Lord, of teaching and training and raising up new leaders. I think of church family members this morning, we pray for Shirley Tang, and Lord, we just pray uh, your blessing on Shirley's life, on her family, Lord, that, that all the members of her family will know Christ as Lord and Savior, and uh, be directed and guided by you, that you'll just give her grace and wisdom as she interacts with her family and, yes. and ministers to them. Gary, Jan, we pray your blessing on their marriage. We pray for Jan as she prepares for another heart surgery. We pray for healing in her body, her strength. We pray even now for the medical team that will care for her, uh, that you will give them wisdom and direction as they care for her. And uh, Lord, we just again want to commit this service, our time together to you for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. And we just encourage you to join with the worship team and sing along as they lead us in song. Thank you.
just a moment. A couple of things just to be aware of. Um, next Sunday night, we're going to have a bonfire out or a fire out at the conference house. That information is in the bulletin, and you are welcome and invited to come to that it's time at 5 30. Uh, Sunday night, please be aware of that and, and plan to be with us. We have Friday night prayer time coming up. We're going to do 21 days of prayer and, and starting on um, September 14th and going through August 4th. We're we'll kind of wrapped it up with solemn assembly here on, uh, on October 4th in the sanctuary right after our morning service. So we would love for you to be planning and, and thinking about joining with us in those 21 days. We'll have some uh, a book put in your hands to kind of give you some guidance through the 21 days. And so we would love for you to just be uh, thinking and planning to be a part of those days of prayer with us. And uh, so we're going to let our kids, uh, ages 3 through 6th grade, you want to have that direction? There goes Josh over there and Sherry and uh, one of those two ministry classes. <laughs> Sure who has my phone, but it goes to the kids back. <laughs> Praise God. It's great to have them and have that available. We're gonna um, just to remind you about offering. The offering buckets are the two main doors uh, on your way in or out. You can see the buckets, there are some buckets there, and you can drop your, your tithe and offering in there at the end of the service. We'll just uh, we're gonna give you an opportunity to give specifically to our missionaries who are with us this morning. And uh, have them come in just a moment, but if you can kind of be thinking about that, just listening to what the Lord would say to you about participating and helping in that offering, and uh, just make sure that you mark that offering uh, so that we know that what, what it's for. We can just write tailors on there in that missions box, and we make sure that all gets there, and uh, we would love for you to, be able to do that. We're going to ask Mike and Brooke to come and baby Matthias. It's been about five months since I saw them last, and, and a baby came in the meantime. <laughs> And thank you so much, Pastor Brad. We are so excited to be here with you today. We drove over from Mankato this morning. And that's where we're living with my parents until we go to Egypt. So we're Michael and Brooke Taylor. This is Matthias. He's almost four months old. And he says hi. Are you going to say hi? <laughs> Maybe not yet. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we're missionaries to Cairo, Egypt. We just finished a two-year MA term there, missionary associate term in Cairo as part of All Souls Egypt team, and we have been approved as career missionaries with Assemblies of God to return to the same ministry where we'll be going back for a three-year term, hopefully next month. So we have a quick video that we can show you here about our ministry, and you can see a little bit of what Egypt is like. Egypt has 100 million people, most of whom have no access to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and many more who are under-challenged by discipleship. All Souls Egypt is a church planting effort that reaches out to every nation, tribe, people, tongue, gender, and generation indiscriminately. We exist to reach the lost and disciple the found. So that is a little bit about our ministry in Egypt. And Egypt is, like it said in the video, 100 million people. 25 million of them live in Cairo. So a quarter of the population of the whole country is in one city. And 86% of those are Muslims. So we have a big uh, group of people that we need to reach in Egypt. And we do that in multiple different ways. And uh, so what we've done is the government actually allows us to have an English-speaking church in Egypt, so we planted an international church in Cairo, and uh, Brooke is the kids pastor there, and uh, maybe you know Rainy Christensen, uh, she is Rainy Christensen's daughter, and she juggles, and does magic tricks, and puppets, she's the best kids pastor in all of Egypt, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> so she's the kids pastor, and uh, I'm the worship pastor, and uh, we just disciple people from all over the world, some people from South Africa, from uh, Cuba, from England, uh, a lot of people from America and probably close to half of our congregation are Egyptians wanting to learn and study the Bible in English. Uh, so we just have this great opportunity to disciple people into Jesus and be the church amongst the unreached. So that's our above ground effort. The government allows us to do that. 
Now we also have a below ground effort, which is reaching Muslims, which is completely illegal. It's illegal in the country to change religion. That's not possible. And actually, whenever you're born, whatever your father's religion is, is written onto your birth certificate, and that goes on your ID for the rest of your life. So if I was a Muslim and had a baby, his birth certificate would say religion Muslim, and that's permanent. That cannot be changed no matter what you do. And uh, so those are the challenges that we have to face in reaching the people for Jesus. And so we do that in a number of ways. We'll sit down with them, uh, share Jesus with them, build relationship, have tea with them, invite them into our homes. Um, Brooke is an amazing cook, and she'll bake desserts, American brownies or banana bread, and they love trying that stuff. So they'll come into our home, and they'll eat food with us, and then we'll share who Jesus is and invite them into discipleship, into studying the Bible, and encountering Jesus, sometimes for the first time. Yeah, so as Mike mentioned, I'm the children's pastor at our English-speaking church in Cairo, Egypt. And so I want to tell you about one of the boys who comes to our kids' church. His name is Omar. Omar was a typical three-year-old boy. I'm sure you've all encountered an energetic three-year-old boy. And um, when he came into church, he would just run around and yell and got all this energy. And I was like, man, this is my challenge. How am I going to get him to truly sit and listen to the word. And um, one thing that was different about Omar, though, is Omar was unlike all the other kids. So about half of our kids were Egyptian and about half were internationals from America, Cuba, South Africa, all around the world. And so Omar was an Egyptian Muslim child. His father was an Egyptian Muslim, and so therefore he was Egyptian Muslim. But his family decided that they wanted to have that community for their kids and so they kept bringing him back every week and just through consistency and creativity um, he started to truly sit and listen to the word of God and he would soak up those lessons and he could answer questions about the stories of Jesus and who Jesus was and what he did for him and just from two years of teaching him he truly began to grasp the gospel story and it was just so beautiful to be able to be a part of that. And since we were in Egypt planting this church, we had that opportunity. But beyond him learning about Jesus and hearing the gospel, which he never would have heard before, we also were able to talk with his parents about having a child dedication right there in Egypt. They had another baby girl while we were there. And so both of them stay Muslim on their birth certificates and on their IDs. But our church was able to have a child and baby dedication right there in Cairo and able to dedicate both of these Muslim children to God. Yeah, so that's, that's just one of the really cool stories God's doing. And I, I have a really powerful one I'm going to share with the message just here in a little bit. But we want to give you guys an opportunity to partner with us. Um, so there's three different ways that you can partner with us. The first and by far most important way is through prayer. And we have prayer cards. They're big enough so you can see our faces. And uh, we have one for each and every one of you. They're free at the table in the back. So make sure afterwards you come by and take one of these prayer cards, stick it in your Bible, in your fridge, uh, wherever you will remember to pray for us in our ministry and the people of Egypt. We truly believe that nothing of significance happens without the prayer of God's people. And that's the way God designed it. You get to have a part in the ministry that we're doing in Egypt. And the second way is you can get. So we are about... 94% of our budget. We are so close to getting back to Egypt. So once we're 100% to grace, then we're able to get our plane tickets and make our plans to return hopefully in September. So we are 94% of our monthly budget, which means we are looking for more monthly supporters. Um, I'm sure you can give through your church. As Pastor Brad mentioned, there's an offering today. So you can give in whatever way you'd like, and that would really help us to get back to Egypt so soon. And the third way you can partner with us is really exciting. Mike's going to hold it up because my hands are full. <laughs> but here is a CD called Humble Feet. And these are available for purchase. It's a $13 donation at our table after service. But this is just a really cool um, way to give. I think it's, it's my favorite way because Mike actually wrote all of these songs. They're original, worshipful songs of just things that God has laid on our hearts as we pursue God around the world pursuing him in his calling into mission. So they're all original, written by Mike, um, recorded here in the States, and 
last year was voted the 2019 Independent Artist Album of the Year. And I would just love for you to get this and worship with us and pray with us and just be a part of that project called Humble Feet. So thank you so much. Yes, I mentioned the $13 donation at the table after church. It's also on, if you do like Apple Music, Spotify, iTunes, it's also on there for purchase digitally. So let's give a hand for Brooke. She just is a wonderful, amazing guy. And of course, Matthias, he always steals the show. <laughs> Yeah, so we, we are hoping to go in September, um, but as of right now, the borders are open. So we can get there, um, but we have to get a COVID test for all three of us and come back negative within 72 hours of boarding the flight. And then they can let us in, but we can't take a stop over in Europe. We have to go direct from America to Cairo. So there's a very limited number of flights we can actually take. Um, so it's it's tricky, uh, but we just found out just a couple weeks ago that the borders are open as long as you follow this long list of protocols. Um, so that is a huge praise report, um, and uh, we actually are still waiting on the vice passport to come back in the mail because COVID backed that up a little bit. But hopefully within the next couple weeks we'll have that, and then hopefully we'll have all of our funding and be able to go before the end of September or beginning of October. So we're getting very, very close and we're really excited to be here and share uh, what's on our hearts and what God's doing in Egypt. So I wanna tell you a little bit more about kind of our journey and where we came from. Uh, before we went to Egypt, uh, actually we're in Madrid, Spain. So we started our career as uh, missionaries in Madrid, Spain, working with Muslim immigrants and refugees. And we got married in 2013 and in 2014, is when we applied to be AGWM uh, Missionary Associates with the Assemblies of God. And uh, we were married at the time and living in a, a small house in Bloomington, and it was a pretty nice place for us, and uh, we were happy together, and uh, I was a gay agent actually at the airport working for Delta, and Brooke was an early childhood pastor at Cedar Valley Church in Bloomington, and uh, loved her job, it was, it was like her dream job. And uh, then God said, I want you to pursue this calling in missions. And uh, we started to take a step forward with that. And we got accepted as missionaries with the Assemblies of God. And uh, what we did from there is we sold all our stuff, we quit our jobs, and we moved back in with Brooke's parents. So to the world, it looked like we were taking a big step backwards. Uh, we were established, we were doing good, we had jobs, and we decided to get rid of all that. But we know in God's eyes, we were taking a step forward. We knew that that's what we needed to do in order to continue on in our journey with the Lord. So I'm going to share a message with you this morning called, Is Jesus Worth It? Is Jesus Worth It? And this is something very, very personal to us and something that we had to grapple with and wrestle with before we got to say, yes, this is what we're going to do with our lives. Is Jesus really worth it? Is Jesus worth the sacrifices that we have to make? in order to become missionaries and follow him. There is a sacrifice that comes with following Jesus no matter what you're called to. Here's just a few sacrifices that we've had to make as missionaries. The first one, which is huge, is Chipotle. Anybody? Anybody love Chipotle? Chipotle is my all-time favorite, and there unfortunately is no Chipotle in Egypt. Uh, Chick-fil-A, anybody love Chick-fil-A? Yes, glory chicken. Uh, there is no Chick-fil-A in Egypt, unfortunately. And this one I didn't really necessarily expect as much, but barbecued pork. Do you know anything about Islam? Pork is haram, as they say. It's sinful. So there's no pork at all that you can find in the country. Occasionally, if you know a Christian butcher, you can get some pork. Um, but it's very rare. So you give me a, a barbecue pork ribs, I'm a happy man. Uh, other things we had to sacrifice, comforts of America. Uh, central air, just setting your house to a certain um, temperature. They don't have that in Egypt. They have wall units with air conditioning. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, so you just have to kind of stand in front of it and cool down when you get too hot. But uh, the green grass, they don't really have much green grass over there. It's just a desert climate. Everything's just kind of brown. Uh, they don't have clothes dryers. You have to hang everything up, things like that. This one's for Brooke, the convenience of cooking. Uh, they don't have Pillsbury dough for your recipe that you put in the oven or Campbell's soup. Uh, you have to cook everything from scratch. Uh, communicating in your own language, 
That one is very, very difficult and very humbling when you're trying to communicate. All I want is a bushel of bananas and you sound like a kindergartner and they don't know what you're saying. Uh, it's, it's very humbling. Uh, owning a house, that's something that Brooke and I have, uh, most couples our age are looking into settling down, getting a house, and things like that. That's something we've had to sacrifice. Uh, relationships with friends and family, that's probably the biggest sacrifice for us, is just being far away from, from grandparents and uh, parents and siblings and our good friends. And, uh, Matthias will probably have to get to know most of his relatives through a screen, and uh, we praise the Lord for things like that, but it is a sacrifice. Uh, things like weddings, birthdays, graduations, we won't be able to be there for a lot of those things. Uh, this one is huge, and, and a lot of people might not quite understand, but Christmas, holidays, things like that, you're, that's focused around family, and when you're in the middle of the desert, surrounded by Muslims who don't celebrate Christmas or, or the birth of Jesus, and uh, everything's desert, and you're trying to watch Home Alone to get some of that nostalgia, uh, it can be difficult. But, uh, and then this, this last one was just the biggest, and uh, the reason why we're there is the freedom to follow Jesus and to share our faith openly. How many here love the promises of God? Love to cling to the promises of God. There are so many in Scripture that are just rich and fulfilling and help us to get through difficult times. I want to share one promise uh, of God that maybe you don't think of as much. Um, and it's in John 16, 33. And he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. This is a promise of God. In this world you will have trouble. He doesn't say, maybe you might if you, if you live life on the edge. No, he says, you will have trouble. If you're a follower of Jesus... You will have trouble. Jesus doesn't sugarcoat the situation, but he does comfort us in the difficult times. Notice how he phrases this. He sandwiches it with comfort. He says, I have told you th these things. Why? So that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So he gives us this promise that we will have trouble, but he also gives us that comfort in the midst of it. Jesus has already overcome the world, and we can be at peace with him no matter what troubles we may face. I want to talk about a character in the Bible, uh, a man of God that maybe you're familiar with. His name is Paul, the Apostle Paul. He used to be Saul until the road of Damascus where he met Jesus. And uh, he went through some difficult times. He went through some very hard struggles to follow his call um, to evangelize the world and to plant the church where it didn't exist. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 24, he says, Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. So the lashes were a whip that they would whip people with that were prisoners or people that were criminals. And uh, according to Jewish law, and you could find this in Deuteronomy, the most lashes that they could give somebody was 39, because 40 was believed to kill a man. So Paul says, on five separate occasions, I received the 40 minus one lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. Verse 26, he goes on. I have been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. That's pretty bad. He keeps going. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Following God's call was not easy for Paul. He had to face those challenges. He had to go into those challenges and know that they were coming and cling to Jesus through them. We see Paul's response to these types of things when we fast forward a little bit to chapter 12. And he's talking about a thorn in the flesh that was given to him. 
and we don't know necessarily what this thorn in the flesh was, but we do know that it was a challenge. It was something that caused him to suffer. And he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and 10, He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. His response is, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. It also says in James chapter 1, verses 2, 3, and 4, it says, Consider it pure joy. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. God uses the difficult things to grow us and to help us mature in Christ so that we lack nothing. Yes, following Jesus has its hardships, but the joys far outweigh the sorrows. I want to tell you a story about a man who's very, very dear to my heart and has uh, become a close friend of ours, and his name is Brother Abdu. And uh, Abdu was a Muslim. He was born a Muslim. Uh, he was raised a Muslim. Everybody that he knew were, was a Muslim, and he was, he was raised in the southern part of Egypt uh, called Upper Egypt, and it's almost completely Muslim in that region. And he decided... When I grow up, I want to become an imam. I want to become the leader of a mosque. And that's what he set out to do with his life. He began to study the Quran and the Hadith and the ancient texts of Muhammad. And uh, he went to the most prestigious university in the world for Islamic study. And it's called al Azhar University. And that's in Cairo, Egypt. And he went to Cairo and he started studying all these different things. And he, st he learned how to lead the prayers and to do the, the prostrations and everything and to lead a mosque. Eventually, after seven years of studying to become an imam, he said, I have too many questions. Every day I learn more, my questions begin to pile up and the inconsistencies just are getting too much. And he said, I don't believe this anymore. He said, I don't believe in Islam. I don't want anything to do with religion anymore. I'm done. And he gave up and he left Islam. He didn't know what to do with his life because he had dedicated so much to this that he said, okay, I guess I'll just pursue business. And he moved to a different uh, country and started his own business and started doing pretty well for himself. He got a couple cars. Uh, his business was thriving. And uh, during that time, somebody came to him and gave him a Bible. And uh, you'll never guess what he did with that Bible. He started to read it, and then he threw it in the trash. I'm just being honest with you, and this is what he told me. He said, the Quran is musical, it's like poetry, you can sing it, uh, but this book seems to be about a bunch of broken people making mistakes. Uh, <laughs> which is fascinating from our perspective in a God of grace who loves us and has come to meet us in our brokenness. Um, but with Islam, that doesn't exist. Praise the Lord, somewhere along the line, somebody gave him another Bible. And this time, he began to, to study and dig a little deeper. And he started to read about Jesus and who Jesus is. And uh, started to question about who this Jesus is in the Bible. And was fascinated with who Jesus was. Eventually, his brothers and his family back down in the village, they said, Abdu, come back to the village. We, we need you back here. You've been away far too long. You should settle down, get married, have a family. He said, fine, fine, okay, I'll come back to the village. And uh, he got, went back to the village, got married, and had two twin boys. And uh, he started working out of his home and uh, continued the business from his home. He set up a little office space. And uh, he said to his wife, he said, this is my office space. This is off limits. This is private. This is where I work. Um, don't ever go in here. And on his laptop, in his office space, he started a document. And on one side of the document, he had Muhammad and all the characteristics of Muhammad according to the Quran. And on the other side, he had Jesus and all the characteristics of Jesus according 
to the Bible, and he started to dig and to compare and to seek out the truth. One day he came home from a trip, and as he opened the door to his house, his brothers were standing there in the entryway, and they grabbed him, and they began to beat him, and beat him, and beat him. And they said, Abdu, you're a Kafir. We know you've left Islam. We know you're not a Muslim anymore. And mind you, at this time, he was not a Christian. He was just seeking the truth. So he says to them, no, no, I swear I'm a Muslim. Don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. I'm still a Muslim. They said, no, we don't believe you. And they kept beating him and beating him. And they said, you used to be uh, a great Muslim. We know you go to the mosque every single day. And uh, you were supposed to be this great imam and a leader of the mosque and of the, the Muslim world. And now you don't even do the little things. You don't even go to the mosque at all. We don't believe you. And they threw him in a room and locked the door and didn't feed him for days. It turned out his wife had found that document on his laptop and reported it to his brothers. Eventually they came in and they said, all right, Abdul, we won't kill you. As long as you sign away all your possessions to the eldest brother, which is the custom. And they handed him a piece of paper and they said, sign this. And he said, fine, I'll do anything. And he signed the paper to give away all his possessions. He was in pretty bad shape, so they admitted him to a hospital. They started to treat his wounds. Later that night, his sister came and visited him in the hospital and said, Abu, you have to get out of here. This was all just a trick. They just wanted your signature so they could have legal ownership of all your possessions. They were planning to kill you tonight. And she gave him enough money to get a taxi and escape from the village to the big city of Cairo, where he could hide among the masses of people. He got to Cairo with nothing. He had lost his job, he had lost his business, he had lost his cars. Even to this day, he's not seen his two twin boys again, his wife, his parents, his family. He had lost everything. And the only thing he knew to do was to go to the mosque because they would hand out free food. And he just sat at the foot of the mosque and would take this food every single day. And after a couple of weeks, he was in tatters. He was, he was rugged. He hadn't shaved or showered. And he just cried out to the Lord and he said, why? God, why did I give up everything and for what? And he said, I need to find out who this Jesus is. And he went to the church, the only place where he knew to go. And he pounded on the door of the church and they opened it. And after some convincing that he was genuine and wasn't a spy or trying to trick them, he, they invited him in and started to disciple him, and started to share with him who Jesus is and walk with him through the Bible and how to, how to be saved. Abdu gave his life to the Lord. And shortly after, he took the public declaration of becoming baptized for Jesus. Today, Abdu's family members still desire to kill him, and he lives with that threat every single day. The daily challenges he faces for serving Jesus are unimaginable, but he doesn't let that stop him from being a living witness for God's glory. Brother Abdu has now started a new life in the heart of the big city of Cairo. He's gained an influence in ministry and he disciples hundreds of Muslims and Muslim background believers into relationship with Jesus Christ. He now studies and teaches the Bible with the same enthusiasm and rigor that he used to study the Quran. He uses his knowledge to train and equip Christian leaders such as Brooke and myself on how to reach out to Muslims and people from a Muslim background. On top of that, God even gave him a brand new family. He is now happily remarried to an incredible woman who is also a believer from a Muslim background. And while, they were, while we were there in Egypt, they gave birth to a brand new little boy. Brother Abu and his wife have become now some of our closest and most cherished friends, and uh, we're bringing back a little friend for their son as well. So we look forward to the day when we can reunite with them again in Egypt, hopefully very, very soon. I just got a message from Brother Abu just this week saying, sending me a picture of their little son and saying, we miss you, we can't wait for you to get back. I want to close with this in Matthew chapter 24. Starting in verse 19, maybe you know it by heart. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus is worth it. And Jesus is worthy. There are millions of people all across the world who do not have adequate access to the gospel. This is the task that has been given to us as the church. Jesus gives us this task, but he also promises that he will be with us. We do not do it alone. It will take all of us working together to accomplish this task. We will have trouble, but Jesus is worth it. It will take sacrifice, but Jesus is worthy to be praised by every single people group in every single language that exists on this earth. Jesus is worth it, and Jesus is worthy. Brooke and I have made a lot of sacrifices to follow God's call in our lives, and we will face troubles. We will face struggles when we go back to Egypt. Some of those things we can anticipate and prepare ourselves for, and other things are unknown, and we don't know about those things yet. But we've been following God long enough to know that Jesus is worth it. No matter what we may face, Jesus is worth it, and Jesus is is worthy. The Apostle Paul was whipped, beaten, pelted with stones, shipwrecked at sea, constantly in danger from religious leaders, the Roman government, bandits, and all those who plotted against him. He endured cold, sleeplessness, nakedness, hunger, and thirst as he traveled across the terrain to foreign lands, all in order to plant the church and bring the gospel of Jesus to those who have not yet heard. Jesus is worth it, and Jesus is worthy. Brother Abu lost everything he had that he worked his whole life for. He lost his home, his possessions, his safety, and even his own family, all for Jesus. And if Brother Abu was here in the room right now with us today, and you looked him in the eye, and you asked him, is Jesus worth it? His answer would be a resounding yes. Jesus is worth it, and Jesus is worthy. Jesus says, in, his, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. We are to consider it pure joy, it says, for he is always with us. I once asked Abdu, why haven't you fled Egypt and become a refugee in, in the West, in America, or somewhere in Europe? And I'll never forget his answer to me. He looked at me in the eyes and he said, If I leave Egypt, who's going to reach my people? And brothers and sisters, that's the attitude that we need to have. No matter what the cost is, no matter what the sacrifice, no matter what it costs, we will reach the world for Jesus. Jesus is worth it. And Jesus is worthy. God has given us a task to reach the broken and hurting people of this world with the wonderful life-giving gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not an easy task, but as the church, it is our task. Jesus gives us the promise that we will have troubles, but he also promises that he will be with us through it all. Jesus is worth it, and Jesus is worthy. Just want to invite you right now just into a time of reflection. And I'm going to sing a song that I wrote called In Step. And it's simply just about following Jesus one step at a time. And I just want you to, to reflect on your own heart and your own life. And what has God called you to in following Jesus? Maybe it's to stay right here in Wasika and just feel like. Maybe it's to go halfway around the world. Maybe it's to be a witness through social media, online. What, whatever it may be. To be in your workplace and to shine the light of Jesus. What has God called you to and what are the sacrifices that go along with that? And I just want you to ask Jesus and contemplate at, the, at this time when I sing this song. Stop. 